Hi, and welcome to lesson one of our second unit, The Road to Revolution. As always, let's kick things off with the hook question. England is 94,000 square miles. The United States of America is 3.8 million square miles. At its height, and that means when it was at its largest, the British Empire controlled how many square miles of the planet? Well, the answer is crazy, actually. It's 13.7 million square miles. Just take a look at this map of the British Empire at its height. It's hard to find a continent in the world that does not have a British colony. The only one that I can see is Europe because there aren't any colonies outside of England in Europe uh, controlled by the British. The British control North America. They have British Honduras in Central America. They have British Guiana in South America. They have India. They have Australia. They have dozens of countries in Africa. And they have many, many countries in the Middle East. The British even have territory in the Antarctic. At its height, the British Empire controlled literally 25% of the world. Britain is a very, very small island nation. And the fact that such a small island nation could control so much territory is absolutely astounding. We're going to focus on one sliver of the British Empire this unit, and that would be the sliver founded in North America. Last unit, we talked about Jamestown in Virginia, and we talked about the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Rhode Island. After that time, over the course of the next hundred or so years, another 10 colonies for a total of 13 colonies popped up in North America. The colonies are divided into the New England colonies, the Middle colonies, the Chesapeake colonies, and the Lower or Southern colonies. In this unit, we're going to learn why these colonies decided that it was in their best interests to no longer be part of the largest empire in the world. Yes, we're going to talk about the events that led up to George Washington's famous Traverse of the Delaware River during the Revolutionary War. In short, we're going to talk about the American Revolution and what caused it. A revolution is the overthrow of a government by those who are governed. Uh, the British settlers, the colonists in America, over time became more and more resentful of the authority of the British Empire. Authority is a weird word. Authority basically means power or right to give orders and make decisions. Over the course of the next week, we're going to learn how the question of who has the power or right to give orders and decisions in America gave rise to a revolutionary war that pretty much gave birth to the United States of America, a completely new country, uh, creating one of the freest governments on earth at the time. Who was the authority in Great Britain? A lot of people think that it was the king, King George III. But in actuality, most of the big decisions made by the British government were made by Parliament. This is a picture of the Parliament building in London. It's certainly beautiful. It's in the Gothic style. Parliament is the representative lawmaking body of the British Empire. This is another example of representative government. Just like in the House of Burgesses in Jamestown and in other assemblies throughout America, people make it to Parliament by getting elected by voters. And those representatives, they're actually called members of Parliament or MPs, go to Parliament debate laws, and vote on laws for the British people. So I don't want to leave this guy out. The leader of the British Empire at this time was King George III, a really young king who came to power in 1760, about 16 years before the Americans decided to break with the British once and for all. George III was a young guy and very, very popular among his followers, which is pretty surprising to a lot of people. This leads us to our essential question, the first essential question for Unit 2. Why did many British colonists in America come to ignore the authority of the British Empire? Our story begins with representative government. Britain could not govern directly the colonies, even if it wanted to. Why? Because there was an ocean between the United Kingdom and America. That ocean was over 4,000 miles long, and it took about six weeks for a ship to travel from London to New York in the 18th century. 
In some cases, it took upwards of two, maybe even three months, depending upon weather conditions. With great distances like this, there was no way for London and for the Parliament to directly make laws that the people of America would have to follow necessarily. And so, the colonists, as soon as they set foot in America, had to govern themselves. Self-government took off in America. Every single colony has an example of representative self-government. Virginia had the House of Burgesses, as we talked about last unit. Massachusetts had the General Court. There was the Pennsylvania Provincial Assembly, the General Assembly of Georgia, the New York Assembly. In short, all 13 colonies had assemblies of elected representatives who came to these particular locations, debated and made laws, and made decisions on behalf of their colonial constituents. Even if you lived in a small town in America, you would probably take, be, become involved in what were called town hall meetings. Ordinary citizens would go to town halls once a week or once a month, discuss the major issues affecting the town as a group, vote on major decisions, and vote on officials to hold those positions. Basically, the people of America had practiced representative democracy for quite some time. In fact, they managed their own affairs for 169 years before uh, the, they'd finally decided to declare independence from the United States. In a sense, they were already independent from Great Britain before the Revolutionary War. The second half of this story um, deals not with government, but with ideas. There was a huge cultural movement taking place in Europe at the time called the European Enlightenment. Enlightenment means to turn on a light or to create light. Looking at this picture, we see a lot of people gathered around what looks like an astrolobe. An astrolobe is a scientific tool that serves as a model of the solar system. If you look really closely at this picture, you can even see Saturn with the rings around it. During the European Enlightenment, thinkers, really smart intellectuals in Europe, promoted the idea that science and philosophy could solve human beings' problems and make human societies ever more perfect. One of the most important European Enlightenment thinkers was this guy, John Locke. John Locke uh, said some things that totally transformed the way people in Europe, intellectuals, viewed government and viewed the right of authority. Who should have the right to have power and make decisions over a, a country? Specifically, he took aim at the idea that aristocrats, and by aristocrats I mean kings and queens and princes and earls and whatnot, were superior to ordinary people. He argued that the aristocrats had wealth, were successful, and were powerful, not because they were any better than anybody else, but because they were born with greater access to wealth, and greater access to education. Because of that, he really destroyed the argument that kings are allowed to rule European countries because they're superior to other people and because God put them there. John Locke argued that kings do not have the divine right to do whatever they want. They are not kings because God put them there. They are kings because they are the sons of kings and because they were born with access to wealth. He argued that all people are created equal. And finally, and most importantly, he argued that people should overthrow governments if those governments do not protect three essential natural rights that every human being is born with. These rights are the, the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to property. If these words sound familiar to you, it's because I basically summarized for you the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he was using John Locke's ideas almost exclusively. There's another element that caused the colonists to ignore the power of the British Empire. And that's uh, the fact that the British really tried to control how the colonists carried out their economic affairs. Take a look at this cartoon. In this cartoon, we have the mother country, who is shown as a queen. 
And we have three colonies presenting things to the mother country. The colonies are providing the mother country with gold and silver, foodstuffs, and raw materials, resources, basically, to give to the mother country in order to allow people in the mother country to take these resources and make manufactured goods. The country would then sell those goods, boots, clothing, equipment, copper petals, uh, petals, or co copper, copper, um, copper bowls back to the colonies. And the businessmen in the mother country would stand to make a lot of money. This whole arrangement is called mercantilism. Mercantilism are imperial trade laws that benefit the mother country over its colonies. Basically, the mother country would take raw materials from the colonies, manufacture those raw materials into goods, and sell those goods back to their own colonies. But what's to stop people in their own colonies from buying goods from other empires? What's to stop the Americans from buying goods from the Dutch? or the French, or the Spanish. And if American colonists buy things from other countries, that's money that is not going into the pockets of British businessmen and other powerful people in England. So this is how mercantilism worked in the English empire. Basically, whenever imports were coming in from Britain to America, and import, I mean stuff brought in from abroad, the British government would charge things called custom duties on these imports. A customs duty is this. It's an import tax. Basically, if goods are coming in from the Spanish or the French or the Dutch, the English would collect a tax on those goods. Those taxes would cause those goods to cost more than British goods. So imagine you're an American. And you walk into a store and you have a choice of buying four different kinds of tea. You've got the British tea, you've got the Dutch tea, you've got the French tea, and you've got the Spanish tea. The Dutch, French, and Spanish tea is all way more expensive than the British tea because of these customs duties that are placed on teas from other empires. As a customer, you're probably going to buy the cheapest thing. You're probably going to buy British. That means the British government is going to make a lot more money. But what happens if merchants don't want to just sell British tea? What happens if merchant customers demand tea from other places? Maybe they want tea from the Dutch because it's higher quality, or there's different flavors, or it's just better or more desirable for any reason. In that case, merchants had a way of getting around all these custom duties and all this nonsense that they didn't want to have to follow. It's through smuggling. American merchants were really great at illegally importing and exporting goods from, from, uh, from other countries. So merchants would still, in spite of all of these customs laws, bring stuff from England, from uh, uh, illegal goods from, from Holland, from Spain and from France and smuggle these goods into the country and make killer profits doing this. And you know what? They were pretty sure that they weren't going to get caught either. Again, England is really, really far away. It's so far away, in fact, that the British government could not enforce these laws. So the uh, English merchants, the American merchants smuggled anyway, and they made a fortune doing so. Maybe you've seen this guy's face before. He's a really, really famous American patriot. He has the best signature in the world, too. This is John Hancock, and this is the signature that he wrote in the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock was a patriot leader, and he made his money and became important in society through smuggling. There's a really famous sci-fi series that stars a really, really famous smuggler who smugglers goods under the noses of an intergalactic empire. This is the most famous sci-fi series in the world, and it's one of my favorite movies of all time. If you haven't already guessed what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Han Solo in Star Wars. Remember, Han Solo is a smuggler. Han Solo is smuggling goods and services illegally under the nose of the intergalactic empire. 
And um, I, I would also want to point out that everybody in the Empire speaks with a British accent. Star Wars is inspired by the American Revolution. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the uh, first lesson in our second unit on the road to revolution. Please read the attached readings uh, that summarize mercantilism, the Enlightenment, and self-government in North America. Have a great day. Bye.